Hi everyone, and welcome to today's episode of The Fist Show. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to welcome you to another captivating episode of The Fist Show. With me in the studio is a special guest who hails from the manufacturing sector. He is currently the CEO of Aqua Vita and the president of Zambia Association of Manufacturers. Ashu Saga, welcome to The Fist Show. I'm well, thanks for inviting me. It's good to be here. Ashu, I know you've been a tough one to, you know, to ca- catch a hold of. It's been a very, very busy couple of months. Uh, we saw you very visible in Q1 and Q2, and now Q3, things are you know, beginning to, uh, you know, to, to heat up. But I think for the purpose of just get, getting some perspective in terms of who you are and what your role is, are you able to share with us what the journey has been like for you to then now, from CEO of Aquavita, running you know, this water manufacturing company, to now being a part of ZAM, which is uh, one of the key lobbying uh, bodies in Zambia for manufacturing? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, it's it's been a very interesting journey in terms of you know running a business is one one thing, but running a lobby organization or being the face of a lobby organization is an, is quite another, and it's 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 sometimes it's not what is the difference. The main difference is it's not about your interest; it's about the interest of your members, right? And the members are so diverse in terms of you know the sectors that we we represent, and. It's not, you have the beverage sector, you have the edible oil sector, you have the agribusiness sector, you have other manufacturing sectors, like even in other food industry. And uh, you have to look at it in a very balanced um, perspective so that you deliver a message that is sort of like covers all your members in the best way possible. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very, while you have to, you, you know, the manufacturing background is important, the ability to look after interests of uh, various interest groups, I would say, is very, very cardinal. I can imagine. Um, what, what, what are the interesting things that Financial Insight has, this, has, has, uh, has learned about ZAM is that you have ambitions of contributing to about 20% of GDP uh, by 2030. Um, it'll be interesting to get you know, your perspective um, in terms of uh, your bird's eye view of the membership and what their abilities are in terms of uh, you know, being able to drive that and uh, how viable this would actually be uh, for the sort of target and ambition that you actually have for 2030. See, ambition is one thing. I mean, it's also set in, I think, the Eighth National Development Plan as a higher target than that. Right. And the, the main issue here is the environment, right? The, the, the manufacturing environment is one. Two, the ability to put, add value to your resources is the second thing. What if you see, the main thing that I think you're seeing in the manufacturing sector, a lot of it was very import-based, adding value, selling locally. What you're seeing is a lot of transition to, to now sourcing locally your raw materials, adding value, consuming locally and exporting. So a lot of the members are now, I think, repositioning themselves in terms of how can you add value to your local resources. And a lot of the um, development in that has to come from, as also from you know, assistance from government in creating the right environment. And we always say this, that if you don't understand your resources as a country, you cannot put in the right measures to add value to those resources. And this is where development of value chains comes in very, very uh, you know, strongly. If you don't understand what a soya bean can do from A to Z, right, and what the various potential uh, value addition points are, you cannot design policy around it. So the biggest thing now that I think we, we, are, we are pushing with government even is understand the resources, Where is it, whether it's an agri resource or it's a mineral resource or whether it's even when you look at skills, for example, we need to really, really be strong on enhancing our skills. But we need to look at how we can take a base resource, right, and add value. So at every point, I mean, if you, if you look at an industry like BMW in, in, in Germany, right, an industry like that supports 10,000 support industries or SMEs or MSMEs, and that's a value chain. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ecosystem with a value chain. The end product is your vehicle, but what is coming into it is supported by support industries. Now, that is an advanced economy, right? You look at Zambia, 
where potential to for m- copper, right? Potential for wheat, potential for maize, potential for soya, potential for cassava. To add value to that and put it on into the into the into a into the economy. These are the things we need to now look at if we're going to reach those targets. Because we've been sitting at 9 to 10 percent consistently for a number of years. But you're not having that exponential change. Exponential and transformational change comes from understanding your resources and putting the right policies in place. We're now part of AFTA, right? Right. If we don't position ourselves correctly, and I use the word correctly, you will find you might be overrun by regional supply chains. You might find somebody who's more competitive sitting in Botswana, although it's only a 1.2 million or 1.5 million population, but if their manufacturing cost base is much less than ours, they may overtake us. So, you, you know, what I'm trying to say is we can't sleep. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's a very, you bring up a very, very interesting point. Um, you know, financial insight would like, to, would like to imagine that your membership has obviously been very clear of some of the critical issues that need to be addressed in order for them to be competitive. What would you say are some of maybe up to five possible issues that uh, need to possibly be addressed, even from a policy perspective, for them to be able to compete? Look, I mean, the first thing is you need to be competitive in tax taxation in the region, right? Right. So we have done a comparison on other countries that are in the region in corporation tax. We need to say that, look, corporation tax for manufacturing needs to be different. So this is part of the issue that we are trying to bring up is why should a manufacturer pay the same tax rate as a trader? Right. When a manufacturer's time horizon to return on ROI might be five to ten years, right? When you have a high investment, capital investment, manufacturers have high capital investment, right? And you are now trying to uh, recoup or get your, your return on investment, it might take you a very long time horizon. On that basis, Somebody who's trading is buying and selling today, is rotating his, his working capital maybe four times in a year or five times or six times in a year. Right. How can you justify saying that that person, that company must pay the same as a manufacturer? And other countries differentiate this. So we need to look at bringing Zambia in at a different tax base for manufacturers because of the long t- time horizon and to encourage investment in the economy. The other aspects are like on consumer taxation, where we've talked about, we've asked for a reduction on VAT, Mm -hmm. and we've given examples of how it might even help the refunds from what we're doing with the mines, and in terms of the the capacity to repay refunds. There is a view that if you encourage consumption by lowering a a, um, consumption tax like VAT, you actually create employment because the more that disposable income, what does it touch? It touches disposable income, right? Correct. The more disposable income you have, the more you consume. The more you consume, the more people, the more you buy from the manufacturers. The more you buy from the manufacturers, the more people in employment. The more people in employment, the more disposable income. It's a circle. So sometimes a small adjustment in consumption taxes can have a big effect on put, putting people into employment. Because there's two parts, there's productivity, there's consumption. You push productivity with the right policy measures, right, on that side. You can push consumption with other policy measures. Yes, one is creating employment directly. One is stimulating consumption indirectly. So there's various things you can do. Right, and, but it's quite interesting that you actually bring up uh, the mining sector because uh, uh, some pundits would like to argue that uh, you know mining being an extractive industry should actually attract lower tax- taxes. Uh, are you saying that ZAM is advocating for comparable with the mining sector in terms of tax, we're, tax, we're, tax regimes? We're, 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 we're advocating for a better environment or taxation uh, that we have been having than what we've been having in the past. Right? We've given reasons. The mining industry is in a total different space. Look, when something is the main backbone of the country, they have the ability to 
uh, negotiate or the ability to, to, to have a certain tax regime in their favor. We're not saying that's wrong. What we're saying is we also are very important. Absolutely. Because if you continue relying on as an extractive industry country, you are not having a long-term uh, lock-in of keeping value in the country. Who keeps value in the country? Are the value adders. Who are the value adders? The manufacturers. So it's actually a relationship that has to exist. For example, mining industry creates copper. I mean, mines copper. They, our, some of our members are making uh, copper tube, um, copper a wire. Some are making transformers. Some are making, uh, maybe they're looking at maybe tubing. So you need to see how do you enhance that industry, right? Now you take the, the aspect of the, the transformer industry, right? They cannot use copper in the purity that we get here. Copper leaves Zambia at say $8,000 a ton, right? But for it to get to 99.9.9999% for a transformer manufacturer to use it, it comes back at 13,000. There's a gap of 5,000. So when you look at that value chain and say, look, why can't we make Zambia a transformer manufacturing hub for the region, right? With the resources we have, what's missing? An enhancement of that copper from 98% to 99.99. Can we create incentives for it? These are the discussions that we are having and we're trying to have to say, look, how do you enhance the industry? Because that gap of $5,000 creates jobs. It does. It does. creates consumption. So these are the things that, you know, when you look at it out of the box sometimes, sometimes we're looking maybe our, linear is too, our thinking is too linear, right? We think about just extractive. But how do you transform the country from an extractive to a productive industry? There's a difference. Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 you know just just to further you know the, the point you brought across, one of the things that we're also observing is that on the manufacturing side, there's uh, there's different layers of the value chains that uh, currently exist. One would like to imagine that it is it does get to be a bit complicated in terms of coming up with a, a structured you know tax uh, tax regime. But then, how do how does Zam see uh, you know, policy being shaped around it so that it can be accommodative and not punitive in certain cases. Look, when you, when you look at, as you said, different layers in the manufacturing value chain, right? When you, as I go back to my point, when you understand the resource and the potential of that resource and what each layer can play or level of investment can play in that value chain, you create the right policy. So now, for example, if you look at the co what we used to have a cotton industry that used to employ 50,000 people in this country, possibly more. Swap and Dola alone, I think, was about 7,000. Right. It was a massive amount of people. Right? There was other textile industries, which basically went belly up in 1990, early 2000s. Right? If we try and bring that back, how do you do that? You say, okay. How can I take that value chain of cotton from A, uh, from A, which is the seed, mm -hmm. to now a final product which maybe goes out under Goa to America, which other countries are doing, right? They're not necessarily growing the cotton, they're importing the stitching, they're take, sending it out to, to, the, to the US. But we had the ability, the cotton industry here was big. So if we think about it to say, how can we incentivize cooperatives, for example, on the growing side? Right. Times have changed to, uh, to 30 years ago, okay, or 20 years ago, where you can actually say, okay, how can we structure the cooperatives a lot better to grow cotton so that now it moves on to the ginning industry, and then the seed that comes out goes into the edible oil industry. From the ginning industry, it goes to the spinning industry. From the spinning industry, it goes to the weaving an industry from the weaving industry it goes to the stitching from the from the stitch uni or uniforms or stitching from there it now goes to export and local consumption that is a long term view of understanding the value chain it's not going to happen in one year right even if you start a cotton growing program it will take you 3 years to 4 years to get it to a certain level but you have to create 
the policy around it. So your policy for a cooperative, what I was trying to get at, is different. Mm, correct. Your policy for the Jinnah, who's an aggregator now, is different. The policy for now somebody who's in spinning now has to put in $40 million is different. Your policy now that may arrive for the weaving industry is different because he's maybe export-based now. Even the spinner might be export-based. How you design policy around that value chain to comes around understanding the value chain. You look at in, in Zambia, you, you've got, apart from cotton, for example, emeralds, precious stones. How do you create value around it? Most of our emeralds are leaving raw. They're being exported in raw form. How do you ascertain value? How do you bring in the local industry to enhance skills, to polish, to put it together and export? How do you look at the soya industry, right? To create soya beans, soya cake, soya oil. How do you look at the maize industry? We are exporting maize across the borders instead of mealy meal, right? These are things that we have to look at as a medium to long-term strategy. How do we change? Correct. Now, I'd like to take you to a different dimension around uh, technology. One of the things that we've observed is obviously, you know, like many industries are digitizing. How does ZAM see the landscape uh, evolving around, um, you know, with technology advancements that are uh, now coming up? And is that a threat to the creation of jobs for the industry? You see, manufacturing in, in, in uh, third world countries, to an, to an extent, will be very labor intensive for some time. You look at how, what is the cheapest source of taking that added value? Is it a labor or is it a machine? So unless you're making that decision, right? There's two aspects. One is the cost. Two is where's the skill to manage the machines? There's a big short, shortage in this country. So labor has, will, and we believe will still have a vital role to play in adding value. Now, let me tell you something. When you want to move from 9% to 20 or 30% or whatever it is, you cannot do it independent of one technology. You cannot do it also in in independent of labor, Correct. manpower. Wherever you feel you might have a substitution in manpower, we believe there will always be a gap in a new industry if we have the right policy to create employment. But if we've looked in most labor-intensive uh, manufacturing countries, unless it is so uh, like chip manufacturer, where it is highly uh, robotic, or vehicle manufacturers, also re robotic, you still need labor. Correct. So Zambia is still a very, uh, at an infancy stage, I would say, where it's sort of like everything is stable right now, but the opportunities have to start opening up. And opportunities, again, come from understanding your ability to add value to a resource. That's true. That's true. And uh, now, final question. Um, we understand that uh, you know Zam has obviously been engaging with Ministry of Finance. Um, post the debt restructure, we're about to see Do Dr. Msokotani deliver a budget that is post debt restructuring. What are some of the submissions that Zam has actually made, and what are your aspirations that uh, you hope to see in the coming budget for 2024? for the manufacturing sector in particular? Look, I mean, we've made submissions on reduction of taxes, obviously. We've made submissions on, on even structuring outgrower schemes properly, where taxation is not the burden of the corporate, rather than, you know, you know what's happening now is outgrower schemes, for example, you get Zambia sugar, right? Whatever they um, grow for themselves is at agro-based agro rate. Right. Whatever they buy from an outgrower, is that corporate rate? There's a big difference. Correct. I think it's between like 15% and 30% on taxation. Mm -hmm. It's not encouraging creating employment in something that is such a low hanging fruit. So this is one of the things we've talked about. There's also issues of excise duty that we've talked about. There's issues on, again, corporate tax that we're looking for a reduction. There is other incentives, I think, that we're looking for for infant industries. Right, and export-based industries. I think 
what is happening is you have this legislation, for example, around EPZs. Yes, we must have EPZs. We have given a tax incentive for EPZs. But really speaking, where is the EPZ? Right? So we are asking, let's accelerate some of these provisions for us to create meaningful industry. Right? The major thing that manufacturers will ask for is incentives. Right? We've also talked about, you know, there's this, the, what has been floating around for the last eight months is the new minimum wages. For us as manufacturers, that's a big hit. Right? We have talked to government to try and find a way to stagger that so that the manufacturing sector cannot, does not absorb. It's a 36% increase. What are you going to do to the manufacturing, the cost of manufacturing? When you're already struggling to be competitive against your, against your imports, right? Will you compete with South Africa? You're already almost at par with pricing, right? Will you be able to export? So these are the things that I think we, we've talked about, that we need to have, uh, you know, a proper um, discussion going forward. Putting the environment, you know, the nice thing, I'll tell you. Let's talk about the positives. You've got stable exchange rates, almost. Right. You've got stable interest rates. You've got stable inflation. Right. When you get these macros right, you now set a platform for stage two. And this is the stage two now where we are saying with government, guys, let us find out the correct way to move forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Asha Saga, Zan, thank you so much for joining us on this special episode. Thank you. I know we've uh, run out of time, but we hope to have you again. Uh, we're about to go into budgeting season, so mm -hmm. it'll be very interesting to see, and hopefully you know, some of those uh, great uh, uh, you know, submissions that you made are accommodated. We'll thank have you. another chat soon enough. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome to East Park Lifestyle Studios. Come in. Oh, yeah.